I was reading a guide to breath meditation tonight. The author's recommendations were that if you focus on the breath, you shouldn't try to control it. But if you find yourself controlling the breath, don't try to control the controlling. And that was the point where I put the book down. The mind, by nature, acts. Every time you breathe in, breathe out, there's an, inten an intentional element there. Every time you look at anything, listen to anything, smell, taste, touch, think about things, there's always an intentional element. And in the practice, there has to be an intentional element as well. And you have to be very upfront about it. If you don't want to control or don't want to control the controlling, you put yourself in a real bind. If the ideal is that you're just going to be totally passive or totally receptive, it gets more and more difficult to practice. If you're upfront about the fact that, yes, this is a doing, this is an activity, then you can watch. When you focus this way, what are the results? When you focus that way, what are the results? When you breathe this way, when you breathe that way, what are the results? You learn by doing and observing. And if something doesn't come out well, you turn around and do it again. Change things a little bit. You get to watch the mind in action. This is probably the most important skill you need as a meditator, is watching your own mind as it's making choices, and then looking at the results. When you can watch that, then you can begin to gain a sense of what works, what doesn't work, what's skillful, what's not skillful, where the different pains and sufferings you're dealing with come from. Then you can do something about them. Because the problem is the fact that the mind is constantly creating trouble for itself. The trouble isn't out there in other people, situations outside. I mean, those are troublesome enough. But the real trouble is the trouble the mind makes for itself. It will take things outside and bring them in to compound the trouble. But the trouble is right here. Now, the solution is not to do it. Nothing at all. Because even the choice not to do anything is a kind of doing. In the meantime, you don't learn any skills. Because as long as the mind is going to be making choices, you want to teach it how to make choices that are skillful. And you do that by watching it. Getting the mind in concentration is a very good way of learning how to watch it. You need mindfulness to stitch together your moments of awareness and your moments of attention so that they become continuous. Mindfulness is the ability to remember you're going to stay with the breath. Alertness is what watches the breath. And as you settle down with the breath, you notice there are a lot of other things right next to the breath all the activities of the mind. And John Cha has a nice image. He says, like you have a room. There's one chair in the room, and you sit in the chair. And other things will come in, and you'll watch them. But you don't let them sit in the chair. I was reading someone's interpretation of this passage, where they said it's basically just sitting and watching the grand show. No, it's not watching the grand show. You're making sure that nobody else comes in and takes your chair. Then you can watch them and figure out what's happening, what's the mind doing that's skillful, what's not skillful, and what you can do about it. 
if greed comes in and takes over the chair, or grief comes in and takes over the chair, or anger, or any of the other emotions, if they take over the chair, then you're down on the floor. Or if it's a squabble over who gets to sit in the chair, you're not an observer anymore. So you stay right here and don't let anybody push you out of the chair or lure you out of the chair. There's that famous story in Thailand, Si Tanon Chai. He was a, the Thai trickster. He was famous for playing tricks on the king, usually involving puns. But my favorite story of the, of the group is one that involves no pun at all. Si Tanon Chai is down in the river. The king is standing on the bank. And the king has had enough of these tricks that Sita and Chai plays on him. He says, you know, you're, you think you're so smart, but I don't think there's anything you could do to get me go, to go down in the river. And Sita and Chai stops and thinks for a minute. He says, you know, you're right, but if you were down in the river, I could get you out. And the king says, oh yeah? Goes down the river. <laughs> then he stands there. He says, okay, what are you going to do to get me out of the river? He says, well, I got you down into the river already. Whether you got out or not, that's your business. <laughs> this is the way it is with our minds so many times. We think we're going to meditate. Something comes along and it lures us out, off the chair. So don't fall for the tricks and the mind can play on you. That something else is more important, or whatever. The trick may be that the mind has to play on you. You don't want to leave the chair. You want to be there so you can watch. But you're in the position of power. That's what it means to be in the chair. Not that you're just watching the show, but you're exerting your intention to be watching these things. Not get pulled into other games. You've got your purpose in being here, which is to understand what's going on so you can do it more skillfully. Otherwise, the mind left to its own devices can create huge amounts of suffering. You sit around with nothing else to do and you think up all kinds of horrible stories about the past or the future. Then you burn yourself with them. And what does it accomplish? Nothing at all. We all want happiness, and for some reason we take our ability to shape our experience and we shape it in the wrong way. That's what you want to watch. And one way of knowing how you're shaping it the wrong way is to try to shape it skillfully, very intentionally try to shape it in a skillful way. In some cases you'll find that it's easy, in others it's hard. Okay, when you know it's hard, that's when you run up against something. So it's not a reason to be disheartened. You've actually found something important. The mind has a habit that you haven't been watching carefully enough, that you're not alert enough to. You have to be able to stand back, watch it. Watch the mind in action and figure out, well, what is this obstacle? What, what am I letting get in the way of the practice? In many ways, we have a really ideal place to practice here. There are little things that are irritants, and for most of us we don't let them stay as little things. We can make them huge things, the point where you can't stay here anymore. So you've got to step back and watch the mind's habits. And it's useful to have a sense of humor about this. This ability to step back is actually very directly related to humor. Because a sense of humor comes from what? The ability to step back from a situation and see what's ironic about it or see what's paradoxical about it. What about it doesn't make sense. All too often when you're in a situation, you don't see the larger pattern. This is where really wise people have really wise senses of humor. Not silly or vicious the way most people's senses of humor are. Why is it wise? Because they can step back from their own actions. And 
and see the irony in the fact that here they are trying to create happiness, and they're creating suffering very earnestly. So when you take this chair, take the one chair in the room, you're sitting back and watching things. Very careful that they don't move in and push you out of the chair or lure you out of the chair. So you can watch them in action and figure out exactly what am I doing here. Where is the misunderstanding? What is the link that I'm not seeing that's causing me to create suffering? Why do I find it so delicious? And why do I find it so entertaining to create suffering? That's what you've got to look for. I said one of the best ways of seeing these things is trying to do something else, doing something you know is meant to create genuine happiness. This is why we have a path. This is why we have instructions on the qualities to develop in the path. So you have something to measure the other actions in your mind against. It's being on the path that pulls you back from your ordinary habits. And there's a lot of energy in the mind that resists. You can find reasons why right concentration or right mindfulness or right effort or whatever, whatever, is not really right for you. It's only when you begin to realize that the path is the standard and your old habits are the things that are meant to be called into question. You can understand that intellectually, but you have to actually see it when you're holding on very tightly to an old habit. in spite of your understanding. When you can see that in action, okay, that's when you're really making progress. When you're putting the mind in the right position where you can put an end to its ignorance. So it's not a matter of doing nothing. There's a lot that you have to do in the meditation. And even though in the beginning you may not be doing it all that skillfully, the fact that you're doing it and you know you're doing it, that's what allows you to develop the skill. The mind is active and your discernment has to be active as well. In order to outsmart all your, your old habits.